Can you hear audio now? Yeah, I, we had one last or last one. Does it matter? Does, that, does it matter which one's in? It's not on.
So, a uh, motion to move into executive session to discuss school issues related to specific students. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So just to let you know, we're going to have a short, hopefully, executive session um, at the beginning of this meeting instead of at the end like we usually do. So hopefully we won't be gone too long. Um, we'll come back and then we'll restart the regular meeting. So thanks for your patience. Yeah. 
Which language is she's a new restaurant owner, so and how would you get a yeah, I'm Vermont Road. I'm like, can you teach that? Yeah. 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 There's a local <laughs> they used to be like, oh, it's like 10 bucks. Oh, really? And you only get 10. You should get a bucket. And I'm still on the app. It's like, what do you want? Section is not the time or place to register complaints by the individuals or items that have not first been addressed through proper channels with those closest to the issue, such as a teacher, building principal, superintendent, or other party. Individuals making statements or privilege for us are to be truly respectful. Mom and first students have to participate in their voice code in situations where there's agreement or disagreement. Members of the public are on to the proper channels and so wish to discuss it before they can send the comments for it to the board. At discretion, the board may invite visitors to its meetings to the basement before the discussion of the matters. The public comment section is an opportunity for residents and visitors to present their presentation. The public comment should take place only in the court of the Persons wishing to address the board must indicate the desire to speak in advance of the signage sheet. Because the board typically has many business items on its agenda, speakers must confront their comments in three minutes. The board will not address specific questions or comments, but may ask before we remain and contact information in the event of follow up is necessary. The board will not permit in public session discussion involving individual personnel or students. Persons wishing to discuss matters involving individual personal students should present their comments and their concerns to the superintendent. We will share them or to the next executive session. And uh, we have one person who indicated they wish to speak with Bradshaw. I guess come up and maybe stand next to the, next to the camera so it, it picks up your voice. <laughs> Over here. Good evening. All right, this message is directed towards our superintendent and to all three policy committee members. 
I attended the September 13th policy committee meeting held in the office conference room because this meeting was publicly advertised on the school calendar. Since then, there has only been one virtual policy committee meeting, which was on October 18th, and zero, and none, no in-person policy committee meetings posted on the school calendar from then until now. Are policy committee meetings now secret, closed to the public? On February 15th, I sent an email to this body requesting that policies 7250 and 7552 be revised to be more parent friendly. The policy committee chair slash board of education vice president replied that my request would be reviewed at an upcoming meeting. She went on to explain that policy quote meetings are not as frequent as general board meetings and that the next policy committee meeting has not been yet scheduled, end quote. It's been five weeks and I'm still waiting for an update on my policy change request. In the meantime, it appears in secret behind locked doors, the policy committee and our superintendent have been too busy to address requests submitted by local community members because they are pouring all their time and energy into gender neutral policy changes, change requests from Albany BOCES. One of those BOCES changes details taking the word her out of the quote nursing mother's breastfeeding section of policy 6550. Seriously? Why are you wasting your time on this nonsense? To the policy committee, if serving Albany woke politicians, aka BOCES, is your primary objective, you have fulfilled that role perfectly. But here in the DeWaynesburg, we don't want woke policies changing changes, woke policy changes from but here in DeWaynesburg, we don't want woke policy changes, try to say that three times, from woke leaders in Albany. The DeWaynesburg community wants transparency and openness from you. But instead, you close your eyes, plug your ears, and pretend not to hear us. Your lack of transparency is extremely disappointing and harmful to our community and to our children. Mr. Superintendent, over and over, you have resisted bringing diverse people together to find commonality in this community. You preach DEI, but your actions reveal that you severely lack viewpoint diversity. It's time for positive change in Duanesburg. Thank you. That's uh, all I have that indicated to speak, but does anyone else here want to say anything? <clears throat> All right. Um, so if you haven't heard, we had a pretty exciting uh, winter season. Um, uh -oh. Ah, God. Can you tell them I'm not a classroom teacher? Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, before I go into all the wonderful accolades, um, I think it's worth mentioning that our cheerleading squad um, went to a WAC showcase for the first time. And as far as I can remember, uh, they did a wonderful job. They really enjoyed it. Um, I think next year they're going to look towards doing actual competitions instead of just game day cheer, which is awesome for them. Um, and one of our senior cheerleaders got WAC MVP, uh, Bree Moss. So that was an awesome accolade for them and a great step in the direction. What is WAC? Western Athletic Conference. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Now it took me a little bit to figure that one out too. <laughs> um, so boys basketball team, um, they were WAC Cup champions and they were Section 2 Class C champions, which is the first time I think in our program history that they actually won sectionals. So that was amazing for them. Um, they unfortunately fell in the CCC playoff, which is an incredibly competitive part of sectionals um, because the C class is so large that they split the boys into double C's and C's. Um, so there's a bazillion number of schools within this area in the section that compete at the C level. 
Um, so unfortunately, they had a hard fought game and ended up losing, but that doesn't take away from how wonderful they did this season. And I'm really excited to see what they do next. Um, we had WAC All Stars. So Michael Leak got first team. Uh, Ethan Thompson got second team. And Peyton Fall, who almost didn't play, uh, got honorable mention. So that's awesome for them. Uh, bowling, uh, there's a picture of all the seniors over to the right with an anonymous um, mascot in the middle. Um, they came in sixth place in sectionals, um, which is actually, I, bear with me, I know sixth place doesn't sound fantastic, but uh, that's their best, best showing in over a decade, and that was against 22 other schools. Um, and they were super close. They were only 13 pins away from getting fifth place. So that's a huge accomplishment for those guys. Um, Tyler Drexel had a series high of 713. Um, if you don't use the bumpers, um, that's a really good score. <laughs> As a bumper user, I might be able to compete. Um, second team, very own Vic Silva, who just happens to be here. Um, and then, <laughs> yep, I had to make that awkward for you. Um, and then Ethan Myers, who came out of bowling retirement, if he's ever bowled. I actually don't know that fact. He's never bowled. All right. Well, this guy uh, came in and had the highest single game in the WAC with 278. So that was a great season. There was a bunch of seniors that came out of the woodworks and were just like, yeah, let's just go have fun. Um, and they ended up having a great season. So that's awesome for the bowlers. Wrestling. All right. I, I know we talk about them every year, but just let me get through it. All right. Um, we had three state qualifiers this year, which is amazing on the boys' side. Um, Scotty Nicolella, Dan Steely, and Tyler Lloyd. Um, if you don't know who Tyler is, Tyler is one of the Schoharie athletes who um, is with us in the merger. Um, so there's that awesome, almost mugshot looking photo in the top right. Uh, I just found out how they do it. They like take their individual photos and then like green screen it and then they put them closer to get ooh, the things that I learned. Um, overall, as a team, we placed third in section two, class D, division two. Um, and this year was the first uh, New York State Public High School Athletic Association women's tournament. Um, and we had two female athletes go, um, Caroline Ash, who was one of ours, and Zoe Lintz, who is a Skokari student. Um, and Zoe actually won the inaugural state championship, which was amazing for her. And the bottom right, um, because Patry is just amazing at what he does, he scheduled a, uh, an entire parade down the elementary school to celebrate those two. Um, so that's the photo, and that's him creeping in the back of it. <laughs> uh, and because we're not done with them. Um, for WAC, we had a bunch of all-stars. So in first team, we had Tyler Lloyd, Jacob Swigard, Scott Nicolella, and Dan Steely. And then second team, there was Tyler Lewandowski, who I don't know if anyone saw, he had an amazing match-winning um competition that was just everyone was off their or uh off their butts watching that one um lucas grenier who did a phenomenal job uh logan kraus who also came out of retirement and dalton cooper so a lot of these guys came out of retirement and have done phenomenal things this year especially the ones that have been working hard all the way through and finally uh ignore the person on the left but uh the girls won the WAC championship again uh, and we're Section 2 Class C champions again, which is phenomenal. Unfortunately, they fell in the C, double C game, just like the boys did. Um, it was a rough game, especially sitting on the sideline <laughs> watching it. Um, but they really had a phenomenal season um, and really excited to see what they do next year. Uh, but we had first team uh, Alex Moses and Hannah Mulhern. Second team, Kate O'Hanlon. WAC MVP was Allison O'Hanlon. And also, um, Allison broke the all-time scoring record ever for Dwaynesburg history this year. So we'll be excited to see how many more points she tallies up next year uh, for the school. See, if, if, am I understanding correctly there are no seniors on that team, right? Oh, so no. Move all these oh, yeah. young ladies up and uh, yep. sweep them again. And yeah. yeah. Okay. Hopefully, same thing for softball. Um, and then our spring season started on the 13th, uh, conveniently the day before all the snow fell. Um, so hopefully we get to a point where we can see the ground again and actually play outdoors. Uh, modified starts on the 27th. We actually delayed modified an extra week um, because they don't play until after spring break. And because of gym space and all that stuff, it's really difficult to schedule things. 
Um, so modified actually begins next Monday. So coaches should hopefully be in contact with all those parents. Um, and we have modified in varsity baseball, uh, modified in varsity softball, and then modified in girls varsity and boys varsity track. So hopefully it'll be an exciting spring uh, once we can actually get outside. If anyone has any um, heaters, things like that, let us know. I'll buy the extension cords. <laughs> uh, yay. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. So yeah. there's no JV for baseball, softball? There is that? not. Okay. So we did do an interest meeting for baseball. Um, and the numbers were almost there. And then we were waiting to see how signups went. And they just never ended up getting to that point. Um, it's really tough right now within the WAC because some schools have varsity, some have JV, but we never know where it's going to fall. So by the time we saw kind of where we we're at, we just didn't have the numbers and putting together a schedule so late is difficult. Um, but numbers on softball definitely made it. So there's only modified in varsity. So if there are a bunch of kids that want to do baseball next year, we're all ready to do a JV. We just need the numbers. So it's not just nine going out on a field. Any other questions? Okay, the next speaker up is Ryan Chichnicki. Chichnicki. Yeah. Chichnicki. Excuse me. 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 Excuse Thank you for having me. I, uh, my name is Brian Chechnicki. I'm the executive director of the Association of School Business Officials, uh, ASBO New York. Um, uh, getting to why I'm here in a minute, but I uh, wanted to talk to you tonight a little bit about the state budget. As, as I'm sure you all know, um, the legislature is in the throes of final negotiations for uh, hopefully an on-time or on-time-ish state budget um, and uh, what the local uh, implications for that budget could be. Uh, just a little bit about ASBO. I, I know that we're not necessarily well known out there, certainly not in the, you know, the, the school boards association uh, uh, type way, but we, like school boards, are a 501c3 membership association representing the chief school business officials uh, around the state, as well as their staff. Uh, and like NISBO, we provide professional development for those SBOs on all sorts of topics relating to school business uh, finance and, and operations. Um, and we also advocate at both the state and federal level on, uh, on school finance topics, uh, representing now nearly 3,000 members uh, across the state. Uh, who am I? Uh, I'm a parent here. Um, my kids uh, go here to the elementary school. Um, truthfully, I am a graduate of Sharon Springs, so my blood bleeds purple and white, but they are purple and gold. Um, and. Uh, but in, in, uh, in having conversations with the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, we thought, um, you know, I don't normally do these kinds of presentations. Um, I do them for other groups. I've spoken at the, the NISBA State Conference. Uh, I, I don't want to get in a habit of speaking to school boards because there's too many around the state for me to show up to. But um, I thought it was important as, as, as being a parent and a taxpayer here to um, offer this to you all. So uh, I'm happy to be here for that. Um, for a little bit more background about me, I've been doing this work uh, for for almost 20 years now. Um, I started my career at the State Division of Budget on the school aid team. Um, so I was I was at uh, sort of in the room when it happened um, when uh, Foundation Aid was first created. Um, after that, I did spend a, a very brief three month stint at the Questar Three uh, Boise State Aid Planning Service before getting called back into service at the Capitol. Um, and for, for those who heard, heard stories about our former governor, um, they are all true. And uh, so I left my job and came back. Um, and I was the assistant secretary uh, for education for a little over a year before, uh, before then sort of landing back at the state ed as the director of education finance. So I, I, I've seen, I've been in sort of all different parts of the school finance world. I've, I've helped develop it in, in DOB. I've helped them do some of the policy in the governor's office. And then my role at SED was really helping to administer it. So we did all the data collection, all the formula calculation, those state aid runs that look like they're 40 years old. That was uh, my staff that was working on. They are, and, and they are 40 years old because the computer system is better. Um, it's, it's every, again, everything you've heard about it is true. Um, I, I've been now with ASBO for two years and had uh, this opportunity had come up. And despite all my time in the state, I thought this was a, a good chance for me. So. Uh, now I get to do some, some events uh, like this. 
So what I wanted to, with that background, I wanted to go over um, just sort of where the state budget is today. Um, I get a lot of questions about how can the state afford what it's talking about spending. Um, so I'm going to get into some of those details and how that relates into the state's fund balance and how they're planning to sustain uh, this funding long term. And then drill down into what that means for Greensburg and looking at um, just some of the, the raw numbers that, uh, that we can see here and, and what that's going to mean from my vantage. Uh, what's next for the department, excuse me, the department, I still speak about SED, uh, what's next for the district. Um, again, this is, this is, this is my take on things. I, you know, I, I've done this for a long time and have spent uh, a lot of time going through these numbers. So um, just trying to, to, to give you a sense of from somebody from the outside uh, with this experience, what, um, what things look like on the ground. So in terms of the, oh, and I should say, feel free to interrupt me uh, with questions. Don't, don't feel me for Um in terms of the state budget, uh, as you all probably know, the governor came out with her executive budget on February 1st. Uh, it's a little bit later this year than normally because um, under the state's constitution, in years after a governor uh, is elected, that governor gets an extra two weeks to put their budget together. Even if the governor was an incumbent, that's still, that's how it works. So um, a little bit later this year, but it came out on the 1st. Um, on February 15th, the state education department uh, produced revised data. So those runs that were produced on the 1st became immediately updated on the 15th when uh, the department updated that data. Um, but that data is going to feed into um, what's going to be in the final enacted budget. Um, last week, the, the two houses of the legislature did submit their um, their budget bills. And so now they're going through the process of, uh, you know, round the clock negotiations, uh, having sat in those uh, those rooms. It's, it's not pleasant. Um, I recall a 36 hour workday one day. Um, so they, they, they do a lot in these next couple of weeks, but um, we can still expect probably, I, what I'm hearing is probably not April 1st, but probably during that week with um, the holiday coming up afterwards, it's possible it'll slip a few days, um, but the legislature is gonna wanna get out of town for, uh, for the break. So um, it seems likely that if not April 1st, probably by April 5th or 6th. So, the, uh, what's in the executive budget? Um, there's lots of different things in it, but there are a couple items that, that I really wanted to, to highlight here to the extent that they uh, have an impact for Dwaynesburg. Uh, the first is uh, the full phase-in of the foundation aid formula. This is something that's been talked about now for um, 15 plus years, and uh, it is now finally here. The, um, the former governor, uh, in the midst of, of some of his difficulties, did agree to a final three-year uh, phase-in schedule three years ago now. So this is sort of the completion of that that um, in turn has yielded uh, a pretty significant increase in education across the state. Um, and I'll get to some of those numbers in a minute. Um, but this year it translates to a $2.7 billion increase statewide, uh, including a, a 3% minimum for all school districts. The legislature supports this. So we don't expect there to be any significant changes to this part of the, the budget proposal. Within, uh, within this foundation aid increase, uh, she also proposed uh, what they're calling the high impact tutoring set aside, which is essentially uh, requiring some amount of that foundation aid money to be spent by school districts on certain tutoring activities to address learning loss as a result of the pandemic. Um, Dwaynesburg is not impacted by this because the uh, set aside did not apply to districts that are on the 3% minimum increase. So, um, the legislature rejects this proposal. It's unclear to me yet if it's going to uh, survive or not, but if it does, there won't be a local implication here because, um, well, I guess unless something weird happens during negotiations, but it seems unlikely to go in the opposite direction to make more districts uh, do that, especially because both houses have rejected it. Um, there's also uh, what I would call the expense base status quo. Um, again, the former governor often would propose changes to building aid, transportation aid, BOCES aid, all in ways that would reduce reimbursements to school districts. Um, the, the current governor has not done that now in her last couple budgets, and so she's maintained uh, that status quo, and so the, the legislature has, has accepted that. Um, you've probably also heard there's been a call uh, by lots of different groups for universal meals to be provided by the state. Uh, as we all know, the federal government was providing those and, and that those waivers expired this year. Um, the governor did not include that funding uh, in her budget proposal. Both houses have done that in their one house budgets. Um, outcome is still sort of unclear. Um, oftentimes in, in state budget negotiations, 
one plus one doesn't equal two. It, sometimes it equals five, sometimes it equals negative five. Um, and so it's really not clear. The, the meals program does cost a lot of money from the state perspective. So, um, you know, I, my former colleagues at the Division of the Budget, I'm sure, are crunching those numbers and, and uh, you know, advising to, to, be, uh, to be diligent about uh, spending the state's money. On the other side, there's a lot of pressure to make this happen. So um, I don't have a good feel yet for if that's going to happen or not, but, um, you know, we'll probably know in the next two to three weeks. Um, as I said, there's lots of other things in the budget, even even specific to education, but uh, these are the things that really impact your the, the local district the most, uh, district budget the most. Um, so as I said, the, the question I get a lot is, you know, $2.7 billion, this is the most that's ever been done before, and the last three years now have been the most the state's ever put in education. How, how are we um, affording this? We went through the GEA a few years ago. You know, how do we know that the next recession hits and suddenly we're not going to have those funds again? So the, the answer is that the state in, in coming through on this foundation aid promise has worked towards making sure that it's sustainable going forward. Um, the first biggest piece has been the continuing use of those federal COVID funds. There's, uh, as, as I'm sure you all know, the, the education specific money that came to districts, but um, the state also got a lot of general purpose money that it's able to you know, use in all sorts of areas. And so that has uh, sort of temporarily plugged a lot of the state's budget gaps and let them do pay down some debt service, do some other things that um, are, are freeing up funds to, to pay for general operating uh, expenses in the future. Uh, as, as many of you also know, there, there were um, some tax surcharges on high income earners in the state. Um, to some degree, those are, are permanent or expiring. And so that all feeds into the, the financial plan of how they're deciding to do this, uh, as well as there's now additional tax revenues from uh, the legalization of mobile sports betting and uh, cannabis sales. And much like lottery and casino gaming and um, the VLT facilities at the um, you know, like Saratoga Racino, um, those funds are dedicated for education. And so um, even to the extent that there are, um, if there are gaps in sort of the general fund from the state, these other sources are going to be funding these education increases going forward. And, and there are, especially in the mobile sports setting, a pretty significant increase beyond what um, what even their initial projections were. There's just a lot more activity um, in, in using them than, uh, than was expected. And, and then lastly, there an expansion of the state's fund balance. And so the expectation that as um, you know, eventually when a recession hits, because it will come, um, that the state will be in a better position to address those needs uh, to the extent that revenues start dropping for um, whatever the reasons may be. Can I just interrupt just one second? Yeah. Brian? So, um, so you just said that it's inevitable that a recession. So talk to me about that. So like the revenue projections, revenue is kind of outpaced what the projections have been so far, right? So why why is there still so much pessimism about what's going to happen? Well, I think the the sort of the two um, the two big factors are just one generally recessions do occur, and it's important for um, for the state to to recognize that having been scarred by you know the Great Recession in, in two thousand nine and ten, you know, probably all remember the ten billion dollar state gap that led to a uh, three billion dollar cut in schooling, um, and so there's there's just some general recognition that. Um, you know, that that will occur. The, the, the thing that I think is specific to what's happening today is as, as the federal government, both through the Federal Reserve and uh, through actions of Congress, are trying to get a handle on inflationary growth and, and some of the continuing impacts of the, uh, of the pandemic, one of those tools, as we've all probably seen in the headlines, has been um, the Fed has been raising interest rates as a way to help cool down the economy, slow down uh, some of that spending. But slow down spending is ultimately how you get to a recession, right? By having uh, you know, people spending less money, buying fewer things, those businesses have less money, and you end up in a, in a downward spiral. The, the, the attempt that the government's been going through is to, you know, what they're calling a soft landing, which is to thread the needle here of making this policy where you can slow down the economy, but not slow down so much that suddenly you're putting businesses out of business and, and uh, creating job losses. So, so far, it, it's still, it still remains to be seen, although in the last couple of weeks, as we've seen some of these significant bank failures across the country, um, there's now some worry that this, you know, finally interest rates are, are starting to have that impact. So, um, 
you know, it is inevitable because there will always be a recession. The question is always, is it, is it, is it a month from now or is it 10 years from now? Um, and, and so I think there's still an open question. There's definitely some concern right now with the bank failures that, um, that we're seeing that we may, um, you know, maybe the Fed has not gone through the soft landing and maybe it's, it's, it's a harder landing that is coming. But, um, you know, I think we're still looking at a few months of, of data to come in before we really have a good handle on, on it. Uh, the flip side to this has been the employment market um, is still running like gangbusters. There's, um, you know, lots of jobs, lots of job openings, um, lots of businesses are having difficulty hiring. I have that problem, I'm sure the district just had that problem. So um, that's sort of the, the opposite side of this is, um, okay, maybe the economy is, is, is growing pretty well. Here. So, um, you know, it, it's really just a question of when and how hard uh, it comes. Yeah. So when you say tax surcharges on high income earners, what do you go into income? Are you referring to income? So I, I apologize. I don't have um, these are these are the stats that I don't have uh, just memorized. But in general, there are a couple um, state income tax percentage increases applied to incomes of a million or more. And so in the last couple of years, I forget if it was one last year, if it was if it's two years ago now. But um, you know, in that in that tax bracket of um, generally four to six percent uh income taxes for sort of the middle class uh rates initially those rates topped out at i'm going to say forty fifty thousand dollars somewhere around there and so they had added on like an additional percent or two for if your income was over a million or so those increases are, have typically been done on a temporary basis so they'll, they'll put them in place for say three years um they'll plan accordingly for that but um then there's the sort of the political discussion of do we let this expire or do they get extended? And so um, right now they're in place, they're helping to fund these things, but if the state decides to, to back off on that and let them expire, then there's sort of a conversation of, of you know, are you plugging in the revenue from elsewhere? Are you doing uh, other program cuts or things? So those are some of the discussions that we'll see, um, not so much in this year's budget, but I think in the, in the next uh, couple of state budgets, uh, this topic will be coming up. Um, the state is also uh, working on expanding its fund balance out. One of the things that um, we experienced with the Great Recession in, in 2009 and 10 is that the state rapidly lost money and quickly exhausted its rainy day funds. And so that resulted in a $3 billion cut to education, a $3 billion cut to Medicaid, um, huge cuts across all other boards. Uh, you know, we state employees when I was there at the time. Uh, you know, our pay was frozen for three years. So um, th there's all sorts of things that, that came from the state not taking these actions previously. And so um, what, what Governor Hopel has, has said now, now that the state has available funds between, um, you know, between these tax surcharges, between the federal money, um, is moving with uh, what the, the Government Finance Officers Association has recommended a 15% fund balance. And the idea there is that, um, the government is essentially setting itself up to pay for two uh, two months of, of uh, expenses. Obviously, governments are a bit different from uh, from businesses, and and so, in terms of having tax revenue at the state level or um, tax revenue in the state aid at the local level, um, those expenses are much more stable. You're not you're not constantly worried about um, you know people not coming through the door anymore and buying my product, and and I'm immediately out of money. Um, but but there is um, there definitely is some need for stability there. And so um, our association, we've actually been advocating for um, the state to increase the current limit of 4%. Um, districts are only legally allowed outside of the restricted fund balances to have a 4% unrestricted uh, fund balance. We've been advocating to go uh, to let districts go up to 10%, which is still below what the state is now doing for itself in her um, her 15%. Uh, well, it's not even a recommendation, it's just that's, that's one area where the government really has control over that. So when you read the financial plan documents, it's not a 15% this year, but um, it's it's sort of a multi-year phase in that she's putting money away so that the next time a recession comes, presumably they won't have to immediately cut school aid in the way that they did in, in 2009 and 10. Um, so as I said, that that state plan is really sort of two months of, of expenses. You know, in our case, the not-for-profit, you know, they, they recommend that we have six months of expenses stocked away, but again, we're, we have, uh, more volatile funding because I have to, you know, I have dues, but also I have uh, programs to put on. So if I cancel a conference, then 
I don't get revenue from that. And so, you know, we have to have uh, more built in. But um, so for us, that's that's six months. But um, under the state's plan, they're going to have two months of expenses socked away. School districts really are only allowed to have two weeks socked away because of uh, because of the fund balance requirement. Um, but as I said, this is really the intent here is to ensure that the state isn't going to come in the next recession a month from now, ten years from now, whatever comes, um, and, and have a significant reduction in state aid as a result. Um, so what what does this all mean, and what's next? Um, what we've been telling our members is um, this is it. This foundation aid phase in is really the last significant investment we're going to see in education in a while. Um, we can't expect that they're going to continue to do large state aid increases statewide in the future. In fact, next year, I've been telling people, don't expect anything. It's probably a, a very minimum increase, maybe a flat increase for everybody, because with the investment, which has been $10 billion uh, over the last two or three years now, uh, which is a 40% increase, right? The state has added 40% in, in foundation aid um, in the last three years. Uh, excuse me, no, 10 billion is the full aid, not just foundation, the full, the full aid. Um, that's not, that's not, that part's not sustainable. What's sustainable is the state has made sort of a time limited investment here to get the, the foundation aid formula fully, uh, fully funded, and then they're going to be done. Um, and so, so that's good for the state and that's good for many districts. Unfortunately, what that means here is even though the state overall has increased by 40% since 2021, Dwayne'sburg's only increased by 12%. And, and I'll get into the, the whys of, of that in a minute, but um, this is really a, you know, there's seven or 673 districts in the state. There's 673 different PowerPoint presentation developments. Um, every, every, everybody's different. Um, and, uh, and and some some districts are above that 40%. Some have seen lots of money coming. Um, and again, for, for very different reasons, but um, it, it makes it important that um, that each district is looking at their, their individual circumstances. I apologize that this is a little little difficult to see there, but um, what, what I'm showing you here is Duanesburg's foundation aid formula at three different points in time. Uh, the first is 2007-8 when uh, the formula first came in place. The second is 2018-19, uh, simply because that was five years ago, uh, and then the 2023 numbers that are currently projected. Um, these again are, these are not the, Actual final numbers, I, I fully expect that they will be, but um, until the budget actually passes, uh, we can't uh, we can't assume that. But it was important, I thought, to show this because um, what it what it shows is that, like many uh, rural districts across the state and especially upstate, um, the loss of student enrollment has really impacted how much money the state is giving districts. And, and that 12% increase number that I referenced on the last slide is largely because of enrollment losses. And so, and, and I don't, I, I mean, I can, I can look at other things in your budget and, and what you're doing, and, and I'm sure there's a, some other factors, but um, just looking at these couple numbers, I can very quickly say, this is this is what's happening here. And, and it doesn't surprise me, again, I'm from Sharon Springs, so I'm, I'm familiar with, with the area. And the, the formula, foundation aid in particular, because it's a per pupil based formula, um, when you have fewer pupils, there's just less money. Um, now there's a there's a save harmless built into the formula so that um, even if you lose students, you don't lose whatever dollars the, district, the state has already given you. Um, but it does impact your ability to to receive more in the future. The second piece, there's sort of a double whammy here. Yeah. How long does that save harmless clause go into effect? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So um, the the technical answer is forever, and and the historical answer has also been forever. The 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 safe harmless. Um, there's a lot of states that don't do this. There's a lot of states that say, "Oh, you lost 10% of your kids. Sorry, we're taking away 10% of your money." New York has never been that way, and so for the last 30, 40 years, there's always been some component here of. Whatever you got before, you're going to keep getting because we're not going to take that away from you, absent you know recession, GBA type stuff. Um, there definitely is conversation these days with um, as the the legislature has changed in comp uh, composition. Um, you do hear more people now talking about, well, why do these rural upstate districts get to keep having the safe harmless money when all the kids are you know in 
New York City or in the suburbs downstate, like as the population shifts around. So I, I don't think there's still a, there's still a very strong political will to keep the safe harmless feature in place. Um, but there's definitely more conversation today than there used to be about it. Um, and, and it's something that we're going to be paying a lot of attention to because um, we, along with many other uh, education groups, are, are supportive of the safe harmless feature. Um, and so, um, you know, again, I, I don't expect to go away tomorrow, but it's something that, that we're all keeping an eye on. But the, the double whammy here that I, I was just saying, so with foundation, you start losing money when, or, or I shouldn't say you lose money. You lose money under the formula, say it kicks in, um, when you lose students. But there's also a wealth calculation that looks at what is the property and income value per student in the district. And it calculates how much you get for each student based off of that. And so the math here is when you have fewer kids, the formula thinks you're wealthier. And so what you can see here is this, this wealth measurement, uh, it's called CWR, and it's, uh, it, it looks at the average, uh, it looks at the per pupil income and property wealth of a district compared to the statewide average. The idea being that if you're a district of average wealth, you have a one, meaning you're right at the average. If you're above one, that means you're above average and, and quote unquote wealthier. And if you're below one, you're, you're quote unquote poor. And what you can see in the numbers here is in 2007-8, Duanesburg had a CWR of 0.6. And that has actually increased uh, up into the, you know, into the 70 percent range here um, in these last few years. And that's largely because of that drop in the student enrollment. So you went from, um, apologies for the, the technical, the TAFU is, is the enrollment count that's used in the formula. Um, there were 1,100 students under the TAP, the weighted student enrollment in the formula in 2007-8. Now there's only 750. And so the formula is running those and saying, oh, you have fewer kids. Even, even with a flat um, property and income value in the, in the district, you have more per student to be able to fund out of your out of your loan. So don't have to change the levy. Don't have to change anything, but the formula just automatically generates that. So this is where it's been sort of a double whammy for a lot of upstate rural districts because as you lose students, you lose the per people amount, and the formula thinks you're wealthy. The reverse is happening again. Is there a calculation that generates that number? Because I can't remember Yeah, so so it, the the ta I have a note there. So TAFU, um, this is what's generating your foundation. It's not really related to how many students you actually have. This the biggest thing is it includes a waiting for special education students. So for every um, that eleven ninety. Every, for every special education student in Duanesburg in 2007, those students counted as 2.4 students. So, so that number is going to be, this number is always going to be higher than your actual enrollment. Um, but, but that's where, so special education kind of comes into play too, right? If you, if you have more, more fewer special education students, the, the, waiting, uh, the waiting can adjust there. Um, but the, the, the idea here, though, is that, especially for a, a, a district like Duanesburg, the, the enrollment really drives a lot of these formulas. And so what you can see here, I, I, the, the two columns of um, dollar values here are what was the foundation aid actually received in that year, and what did the formula say the district should have been getting if it was fully funded? Obviously, this year being now a fully funded year. So in 2007, the district was only getting $3.9 million against a formula amount of 5.8. But now as a result of those enrollment losses and, and other things, but again, enrollment's largely driving it, that 5.8 promise has dropped to 5.2. At the same time, over this 15-year period, uh, or 16-year period, I should say, um, the state has increased foundation aid. The, this safe harmless feature has been built in. And so now the district is actually receiving more than what the formula would say. And again, we're seeing this in rural districts across the, across the state. Um, and so that that $2.7 billion that the state's funding through foundation aid, there's about 200 high need rural districts in the state that aren't getting through uh, because they've all experienced the same enrollment loss. They're all on this 3% uh, Yeah, hey, I have a question. So if we have enrollment uh, loss, sir, sorry, sorry, the taxes. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. The, yeah. the, the public isn't really allowed to ask questions. Oh, OK. So um, 
take, taking all of that into account here on, um, I looked at, at some of the neighboring districts around here and, and, and how this year's budget with the final phase in looks. And so, uh, you know, Dwaynesburg, as, as you know, is, is on the 3% the, the minimum increase. That's about $150,000. Um, similarly, Burn Knox uh, is also on the 3%. Again, you know, you, you can sort of see the trend of, of, of district demographics. Looking at Shalma, Mahanison, and Schaharia, though, there are much larger foundation increases. Again, this is all, you know, every district is a different story how they got to this place. Um, but, um, but again, uh, you're not seeing in places like Duanesburg and Bird Knox the increases that um, other other districts are seeing. The other the other uh, piece that I put in here because I think it's important that um, I know in, in my work we always look at it. Every district has um, a different composition of state aid and local revenue funding their total budget. Um, generally, just high aid districts have a much higher percent of state aid uh, funding their budget. In places like Buffalo, it's like 80% of their budget is coming from state funding. Um, on the reverse side, in places like Scarsdale and Westchester, um, it's more like 10% or even less is coming from uh, from the state. So it, it really varies widely. And so when we're looking at the percentage increase in state aid, you also need to um, take a look at what does that mean for, for the local budget. And so um, this, uh, we call it TGFD, it's a, it's a proxy for budget size, just looking at the general funds, uh, it doesn't look at the special aid funds or um, any of, of those other items. But um, when you look at these foundation aid increases against um, the total budget of the district, again, you see this, um, this impact that places like Duanesburg and Burr, um, it's a relatively small increase against the budget because you have a small increase against a, you know, a subset of, uh, of the total budget. It does also bring down those numbers, right? So Shalmont, 22% increase in foundation aid. It's a lot of foundation aid. It's a 3.5% increase in the budget, right? So there, there's sometimes the, those numbers get a little, little distorted too because you can see large increases in places that ultimately don't have a big impact on the district and vice versa. You can have small increases in you know, a place like Buffalo if it's, if it's a 4% increase. That's 3.5% against their budget, right? So. Um, it, it can it can really vary widely. So I, I always like to, to show that when we're talking about aid increases because it's not just about uh, the aid that's received. Can you see an explanation for, like, for example, Shaman, like why they increased their budget? Like, is that 21.7%, but overall general funding spending is only 3.6%. There's quite a bit of a spread there. So how, can you give me like, some idea how that happens? Yeah, so, yeah, so um, without having the numbers right in front of me, in general, when you see that the, the, the larger disconnect between what you're seeing in the state aid number and against the budget number, the, the lower the percentage of state funding the district relies on, right? If so, again, kind of using this, this Buffalo and Scarsdale example, Buffalo is about 80% of its total budget comes from the state, and so a 3% increase in state funding is going to be a, um, a 2.4, uh, I should call it calculated this, but um, a, 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 it's going to be closer to that 3% number because the bulk of the funding, the bulk of the budget is being funded by the state. On the opposite end of the spectrum, where you have the Scarsdales of the world, where a very tiny amount of their increase is coming from state aid. They can have a 50% increase in state aid, but if it's only funding 10% of their budget, you're only talking about, um, you know, adding essentially 5% of the budget in total. Um, so 50% increase, only 5% of the budget. And, and what I think you're seeing here, again, without looking at the numbers, um, Shalmont and Mahanison both are, um, I imagine they are both average, listed as average need districts from, uh, from a state. And so when you're, um, in the, that average need category, they're less reliant on state funding um, and are, are more reliant on their local property taxes. And so a 20% increase in state funding only translates to a smaller increase in their overall budget because they're relying mostly on their property taxes. So how does that get determined if you're relying more heavily on state aid versus your property? It's, um, it is a long combination of history and 
board actions and property levies, you know, tend to be relatively static or you know increase. There's, um, not a, there's not a lot of volatility in, in those rates. So all of all of what has happened in the past leads you to today, and then that kind of combines with whatever the, the circumstances of today are. So you could have two very and, and I not understand this, I'd be curious to look at Dwaynesburg and Burn because in this case they're very similar, but it's very possible that when you drill down, it could be very different for all these reasons that there were decisions made in one district for 20 years that went in one path and decisions made in another district that went in a different path. So um, it just, it really, like I said at the outset, there's really, there's 673 different stories about this and there's not, there's not one, there was not one policymaker, not one formula that's sort of pushing the button saying this is what you get, um, but it's really the, the you know, compilation of all sorts of decisions at the state and local level for a long period of time. So, so this uh, this kind of helps explain why for some school districts it's easier for them to go out without any increase in their taxes because they got such a big increase in foundation fee. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that I, I won't I won't speak to people's easiness or not easiness, but yeah. but I I think. This information is is what those districts are looking at when when they're making those decisions, and um, I, I think in the in that breakdown of um, you know how much state versus local funding and what are the expectations of future state funding, um, that's really all in the mix there because ultimately um, some of those districts are saying you know we're fine with our state aid we're um, you know we think we're we're going to keep receiving a lot, you know, the Shalmans and the Hanasons of the world, these last couple of years, we're looking at these numbers, I'm sure saying, oh, I'm going to get 20% in foundation aid in the next two years. That kind of covers my costs. Um, I, I think going forward, as I was saying at the outset here, the fact that this formula is going to be fully funded, right? We're not going to see these numbers next year, right? Everybody's going to be able to 3%. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's an even smaller amount. It, um, I hate I hate dating myself, but um, you know when I started at DOB under the Pataki administration, um, it was a one percent increase. Districts only getting a one percent increase in their flex aid portion. So um, it's not it's not um, out of the question. Um, but but I think these are the types of conversations that people are having about you know what does the future look like both for the state but also um, for the district. So, um, as I said, you know, it, in terms of looking ahead, uh, you know, I've been telling districts and, and other associations, um, you know, be mindful that this is likely the end of the road for these big increases, and, and what we can expect in the future is is probably smaller. Um, actually, to, to your question, some of the we've also put out some research on on this interplay of, of of state versus local revenue, and one of the things that we've seen is that districts that um, Proposed at or below their property tax cap level, um, passed at a 99% rate. Um, districts that look to pierce the cap um, and go above that do um, do you find less success because they have to meet that 60% threshold. Um, I think it's in the in the realm of more like a 50-50 proposition uh, in terms of, of people passing it. But um, but there there are almost no budgets that are either at the cap or below the cap level that that fail to uh, fail to pass. Um, that same research has shown that. There are a lot of districts that um, came in below their cap level um, for all these reasons that we were just talking about. So because um, because the cap is really reset every year and, and whatever, whatever you've done in the previous year for your property levy, um, that becomes your base forevermore. Um, so there, there are a bunch of districts in this 2015 to 2020 time period that we looked at that didn't use their full cap amount. Um, they passed their budgets. They, you know, they, they they made the local decision that they wanted to, um, but ultimately, it, it, it's a cumulative matter that left 2.2 billion dollars uh, on the table that districts across the state did not um, did not levy, and you can't get that back once right once once the years have been completed. Um, they you, you can't. There's no there's no allowance to sort of go back and, and reuse unused cap level. Um, so that's just something that that districts have been. Uh, have been thinking about it again. Each district is different, and, and many have chosen to, to keep flat or um, flat levies or, or levies below the cap. But the, the flip side is that that sort of it's not just next year, but it's it's forever that you're sort of 
closing that opportunity off, unless unless you want to go for a super majority at some point in the future, which is you know some districts do that, but again, it's it's a riskier uh, a riskier proposition. Um, oh, that was the last of those things. So, um, so I'm again, happy to answer any other questions. I could talk about this for literally hours. <laughs> and if I had a few more weeks of pouring through the data, I probably could add a few more slides. But um, this is yeah. Um, it's very yeah, it's been a great. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, Superintendent. I'm going to cede my time. Uh, yeah. Other than to say that um, there's a school in high school, which is why we're in the cafeteria today. <laughs> and so please come to the high school musical. And then also there's a musical in elementary school on recently, and that was wonderful. And so I think everybody who is involved. Jeff. That was your number of people that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, this will be uh, the final work session, budget work session uh, for the 23 24 budget. Uh, so, we got the little school bus moving right along here. Uh, so, at the at the next meeting, we will uh, have a, a draft budget for the board to accept to put forward towards the community for a vote. Uh, so, tonight we'll talk about uh, special education, uh, instructional uh, budget lines, employee benefits, and debt service. So, first we'll talk about the revenue side of the budget. Just a little review of where we are. Um, nothing's nothing's really changed for the revenue side. Just a recap of the tax levy, uh, though the only thing that did change is our actual cap. So uh, when I presented the budget earlier on, the cap was at 3.71. Uh, after one of the uh, properties did not file uh, for a pilot in time for the deadline, which is March 1st, uh, that changed the, the tax cap to 3.91%. Uh, so. Uh, the district does have the ability to tax uh, with the 333,682 at the 3.91% tax levy increase if they so choose. Uh, the tax levy right now that we've got uh, budgeted is a 1.96% increase overall from budget to budget. Uh, that'll be a uh, total dollar increase uh, for the tax levy of 167,321. So uh, this is uh, just a look, uh, Francis, I, I think you had asked for this slide uh, back at the last session. So this is just a little example of what the, uh, the tax levy increase of 1.96% would look like uh, on, a, on a house assessed at uh, $300,000. You're looking at about, uh, in the ballpark of about $91, $92, uh, $92 for the whole year for an annual increase. Um, so that's based on that 1.96% increase. Um, so you can see I also put some other home values in there at 100,000, 200,000 as well. So you can see uh, kind of like based on a $100,000 house, you're looking at an annual increase of about 31 bucks. Um, monthly, monthly you're looking at about $2.54. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty small price with that 1.96% increase. Uh, this is just a recap of the state aid. I give you a better, this is a little bit different uh, view of it um, from the last time, kind of recapped and just highlighted the, uh, the important budget lines uh, in the state aid line. So again, that foundation aid uh, budget line, that 3% increase from, from last year uh, is 155,585, uh, only giving us that 3%. So uh, then there's the expense-driven aids, didn't really change much uh, because of so many different things that are fluctuating with expenses. So that's kind of a, another recap of a summary of all of them put together. It really gives you that, that visual of where we're, we're really at with our other aids. Uh, and then our other aids, the other category on the bottom there, software, library, technology, uh, textbook, uh, that doesn't really give us much to 294 bucks. So uh, not really a big change there. 
Uh, and then this is a uh, this is where we are with our, our revenue side of the budget. Um, the real property taxes at eight, a little over eight point seven million, and then uh, state aid eight point nine. Uh, and then some, there's some other uh, revenues there, really small revenues. Uh, and then balancing the gap for the budget uh, with the, uh, the fund balance there of $947,000. And then uh, some also a reserve appropriation of $140,000. Sure. Did the reserve appropriation go up or not? It did. It did. So the expenses have changed also uh, since the last session. So I'll get to that in a when we get to the expense side. So in order to uh, in order to balance the expense side of the uh, the budget, we had to put more revenue in there. So we're pulling more from, from our reserves to make that to make that happen to actually balance the budget. So overall uh, budget to budget showing so sorry uh, 2.07% increase uh, from budget to budget that you'll see again on the uh, in a couple slides here, we'll show the uh, the expense side. It's a, it's a very modest increase in budget where a lot of contractual expenses are increasing about an average of three point five to four percent rate interest rate. So that's that's a pretty pretty sharp pencil work to get it down. It is. There's a lot of trimming of some some of the budget lines to try and cut out anything that may cause additional fund balance. That still leaves us with uh, what percent? Uh, but we're using so we're using uh, 0.74 of the reserves, and like 4.99 percent. So we're over five percent use of reliant on on the fund balance and reserves. Uh, so looking at our budget, our revenues uh, have teeter tottered back and forth. State aid and real property taxes. They they come in at about uh, anywhere from 47% to 48% uh, uh, each one of those categories. So the rest of the revenues are really a small amount uh, of the budget. So we rely heavily on on those real property taxes and the state aid. It's not like we have any, anything else that's giving us an additional revenue. Uh, so this is just a look at um, our fund balance and reserves. Uh, where we're relying on that, that gap to be filled from. So over the past few years, it has increased uh, significantly. You can see that back in 1920, we were all the way down at a little over three, three and a half percent. So now in order to, uh, to balance the budget because of inflation, um, we've got a lot of expenses that continue to rise. It's not like we're seeing an additional amount of money come in with a foundation aid. So we have to balance that gap with something. So somewhere, uh, this has got to give. Uh, we're going to eventually, if we continue on this path, we will run out of money. Expenditure side of the budget. So uh, this is just a look at the expenditure side of the budget. Uh, it still, we're staying under $19 million. Uh, so the 22-23 school year budget was $18,600,000. Uh, this year right now estimating at 18,985,000. So we stay below that 19 million with a overall budget to budget increase of 385,000 or 2.07% increase. Uh, showing that tax levy increase also that 167,221. Uh, you can see some of the categories that have increased. The, the one that's been increased the most is the instructional side of the budget, which is the uh, largest, really the largest portion of the budget. So you're going to see that increase because of all the contractual you're paying a lot of salaries. So we've uh, we've talked in the previous work sessions about general support, uh, transportation, operations, and maintenance, and now we will go off to the other three categories of the budget. So first off, uh, instructional. This is uh, a lot of uh, all your teacher salaries, contractual uh, expenses. Uh, teacher assistance and aids, any uh, supplies for that are used in the school, textbook money, um, and then uh, any reg regular ed education expenses with BOCES, uh, BOCES CTE kids. So this is where we also pay for the kids to go to CTE centers. Uh, and then uh, further on down, we have 
uh, library expenses in the 2610 codes, uh, library supplies, library books, and then we're able to purchase uh, some library subscriptions through BOCES, so they have computer, uh, now they have computer subscriptions so that kids can check out books online. Uh, then we, uh, we get on to uh, the guidance section, the 2810 codes. So you're, you're also covering your counselors and supplies for, uh, for guidance expenses. And then some of the, the guidance expenses for BOCES. They have some uh, applications also that they use in guidance to help kids out to plan for their, for their future careers. Uh, there's uh, also the health section. So you're paying for your nurses in that section, 2815. Any contractual expenses, like uh, tonight there's a uh, resolution to pay for health expenses for a kid in a private school. That's one of those budget lines that you, uh, that's where that comes from. Uh, psychologists, like salaries, uh, contractual expenses also for those, testing that's required, supplies for those tests, um, and then the BOCES expenses also with, uh, with mental health. Um, and then uh, social worker salaries, also in the 2825 with um, uh, a small budget line there for supplies as well. Overall look at um, the uh, past few years for the uh, instructional budget, it's fluctuated from time to time. Uh, it all depends on staffing and uh, contractual expenses. For the most part, uh, the biggest expense you're gonna see here on the instructional side this year is the salaries. We're not really uh, creating more positions this year. We just gotta pay for those contractual expenses. Uh, the other thing that, that did uh, increase is the, um, we increased the contractual line for, for an SRO in the elementary school, so we are adding another uh, SRO for the, for the district so that we can continue to have uh, safety in both buildings. Uh, unfortunately, no decreases with, uh, with the, the expenses in uh, instructional budget. Um, so this year, nothing really, nothing really caught, so we're not cutting any programs. Just staying with, uh, with where we are with the programs in 22. Uh, then we have uh, following that the uh, instructional administrative side. So um, curriculum development, which is required that we uh, provide curriculum development for our teachers, uh, administrative salaries and support uh, for the administrative uh, team, and then uh, contractual expenses that are tied to that small budget for administrative supplies as well um, and then also some uh, in-service training so there's there's the 27 2070 code also is uh, some training as well so it's, uh, trainings, trying to get that to instruct needs uh, this is the instructional administrative budget um, not too big of an increase just some salaries and contractual obligations really to uh, from, to increase from budget to budget. And then uh, special education, the section uh, we have to pay for the, the teachers that provide special education services for our, uh, for our students. Uh, also, we have uh, tuition that we uh, send out kids to either private placements or we also utilize uh, BOCES to get some aid back on, uh, on those expenses. Um, it, it fluctuates from year to year depending on the student population. And then there's uh, some small budget in there also for uh, special education supplies. Contractual expenses uh, can be uh, pretty expensive in some years, just depending based on you know, where those kids are placed. So uh, the past couple of years, the, the, uh, the budget line for special education had actually decreased. Uh, it was quite extensive in 2021. Um, after the 2021 year, moving into 21-22, uh, there had been some budget lines that uh, definitely were not needed because we had kids that exited programs, graduated, and moved on. Um, we were able to cut the budget a little bit and uh, put that money towards other things that we also had in, in our district. So um, this year, though, going into 23-24, we are gonna to have to increase that special education budget a little bit more because we do have some contractual expenses that we have. Uh, the, uh, the debt side of the budget, this is really uh, pretty much decided on, um, on any of the capital work and our, our bus purchases. So uh, this 
this budget basically right now you can see I put a little red arrow as to where we are in our debt payments, our current, our existing uh, debt payments. Uh, once this capital project that's coming up, the Centennial project uh, comes through, um, this this will actually this graph will change a little bit. Uh, but right now you can see we're starting to uh, get to a point where 25 the 25 26 school year it'll drop off after that year. So. That's why we've decided that we're going to do a capital project after that 25. Uh, but this year, the, uh, the the debt budget is increasing a little bit because of some bu some bus payments. Or I'm sorry, it's going right down because of the bus payments. Uh, so the, uh, the the debt, the bus debt is actually, I've put a chart on the right-hand side there just showing uh, where we are going into the 23-24 school year, and then some projections on some uh, some bus costs as well in the future. Uh, so the 9711 code is uh, your expenses for construction, any uh, construction capital projects, bond payments. Uh, the uh, 9722 is for those bus purchases. And then also we have that 9731, which is typically only used for about a year. Uh, and that's for to borrow to start to start a borrow with a ban that, that gets borrowed the first year, and then we change it to a bond. So this is an overall look at the uh, next year's uh, budget. So it did it did go down a little bit um, from from last year, and that's because some of that uh, some of that interest has started to get paid off with our capital project that we had in 2016. Um, so anything that will make this budget go up a little bit over the next couple of years will be for some bus debt. So as, as we're seeing right now, the, the buses are getting much more expensive as we uh, talked about the last budget meeting. And then uh, the benefits budget, The uh, this, this includes everything from health insurance. Uh, we also have a health buyback in the contracts. Uh, dental insurance, we have a self-insured dental uh, plan which uh, does very well actually for us. So um, we've, we've seen a 0% a increase for several years now. So that's been that's been great to have that dental plan. Uh, retirement, this also pays for uh, retirement systems, flexible benefits, social security expenses, unemployment, and disability insurance. Uh, it is going up next year. There are some increases, uh, social security and workers' compensation. Um, because of our discussions for our health insurance trust, we're not seeing too much of an increase on the health insurance line this year. So we're leaving that flat, uh, especially after, so after seeing a 15% increase last year, uh, it's, it's definitely a good job. <laughs> uh, so on the, on the uh, propositions this year for the 23-24 school year, uh, will be to approve the 23-24 uh, budget and uh, the next one will be to uh, approve the purchase of three buses at a maximum of $400,000. Right now our estimates actually came in lower than that. But we have a maximum cap. And then uh, the next one, there will be actually a third proposition this year will be to approve the use of the $600,000 in cap. Yeah. I'm sorry. Is it $600,000? It's the six million uh, of the existing capital reserve fund to pay for that first part of the, uh, the the capital project. This reduces the need to borrow up to that twenty eight million for the capital uh, project. So uh, this saves the taxpayers from that having to pay that interest for that six million dollars. Um, this will help us to move long term for our capital project. So. That's why. So whether the voters approve the $6 million, the use of the $6 million from the capital reserve or not, they've already approved the use of the borrowing $28 million for the capital project. So we would like to use this toward that. Um, so that's what we're asking the voters to do. We could have done that at the same time that we did the capital project. And, um, you know, next time that's something to consider when both of those propositions at the same time. Um, okay, and then, Yep. So, just uh, this is uh, tonight we talked about debt service and employee benefits, instructional. Um, next time will be the budget presentation to the board. 
to accept the budget. So um, we've seen all the different parts of the budget up to this point. There's one one bigger change this time is that the, the cap amount, the amount that we're leaving on the table has grown. Um, at the same time, the amount of reserves that we're using to balance our budget has also grown. Um, so I have to ask the question, um, because Jeff would want me to ask the question, which is, do you want to keep the levy where it is um, at 1.96% and continue to use that much in reserves to balance the budget? Or would you like to consider using um, you know, more of the cap? Um, money that's, that we couldn't use. Uh, so, listening to Brian's presentation and Jeff's, it makes me think that we should at least have a discussion about So, let's start there and then um, let's talk about any of the other sections we want to talk about. Jeff, you live here, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, we all live here, but what do you? Your it's a to, to increase the taxes a little bit to make sure that we protect the district longer. I I pay the extra taxes because we could face a, a much larger increase yeah. later on down the road. And I know that we had talked about that you know, neighboring districts. We've seen how that's how that's gone. To, to continue, we continue to, to try and do our best at staying low. Um, but we've talked about inflation. Um, for myself, if I have to make sure that programs are there for my kids in the future, I'm going to pay for them. I think we also need to consider you know, this affects everybody that lives in the community, not just parents majority of people paying taxes don't have kids in a school district to have those benefits. So, you know, we need to consider everybody who have that discussion of raising taxes at all because some people aren't getting job raises as contractually some of the admin and teachers here are. There are a lot of people out in our community that are not getting those and suffering from inflation. And then to raise the taxes even more, that's going to be a big question. What, what kind of difference would you, would you anticipate? Yeah, it's 1.6. 2.8 or we have any 2.01? Yeah, would you just make up the 40 grand? Yeah. To go to... Oh, just the 40 to get it back to where one of the 100,000 dollars over the last well, year. Well, I'm just curious. What's your trip? I mean, I've... You could go, uh, I mean, you could go either way, right? So, Sarah mentioned, yeah, there would be some uh, people that are going to be upset with that increase. A 1.96% increase, is sh I showed this slide right here. So, um, right now, uh, that's a price of uh, a couple of pizzas and wings, unfortunately. Right now, right? So, to increase another. I mean, right now you're at almost two percent. So we go up to two and a half. I mean, point four is it? Point four is. Zero, 
or I don't know how high these gone up. I don't know if you've ever done it before, too. It's the, the trend has been, we've been at two since, uh, I believe, 2004. So, um, so then with inflation that we haven't seen going down below 6%, we can't we can't continue on this path. Because then we're going to end up, in future budgets, we are going to be cutting severely. I mean, the same forces that have been people's budgets affect like our budget, right? right. You know, we're paying more for gas, we're paying more for gas, you know, it's actually good. It's expensive for the budget. Part of the only event is that it's good. Yeah. And every budget does that. Yeah. 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 Excuse me, can you guys speak up? We can't hear you back here. I have to spend some time. So as much so we have not used any reserve yet in the past what uh, two years. I I can't remember actually using it yet. And now we're starting to see uh, starting to see that 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 savings now that we're balancing our budget with more fund balance. It's it's getting spent. So now that that protective that money that you've been saving in the bank is now going to get spent. And, and how much? Uh, at this time, like at the end of I mean we won't know until the end of the year. Right. So this year it's it's poss it's it is a possibility that we will be dipping into um, a big chunk of the fund balance that we actually put into the budget for the twenty two twenty three school year. So I ran a I ran a report just to kind of give myself a, a number to go off of, and I ran on March uh, 14th. I, I ran the percentages for how much of the budget has actually been spent um, on March 14th. So that was what I do on Saturday. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I found that we had spent almost about 59% of our budget on March 14th of this year. On last year, we did we were somewhere around 55, 56%. The year before that, on March 14th, we were around 51%. On that same very day in the calendar. So we've spent more of percentage of the budget from year to year two on that same point. So, um, also, you'll see in our audits that we've spent more over the past three years by the end of the year as well. So the revenue is is going to need to catch up because we're going to get ahead of the revenue at some point. I mean, we do need a direction. So if you would tell us what you'd like to do, want to stay the same as time if you want to. Uh, Increase from the have to. We don't have the luxury of the uh, state legislature and governor by giving extra time to put our budget together. <laughs> we have to put our budget together and we have to present the terms. So, uh, do you have a thought of what you'd like to do? I mean, my thoughts are I'd like to increase our tax levy, but I also want it to pass. So, I feel like I want like, a safety net number. Um,
more conservatively, but still get the same things that provide for the future. And here yeah. it's a business, it's, yeah. and so every business has additional cost every year, so it has to have, have some kind of increase. Can't increase it, we need to keep everybody in mind. Because the income people get to that age here, it's the income person, and that's, I'm sorry, but also we have technical income. This small and just try to right, get things to see what happens, but it is a business, and we do have to increase something. Keep it status quo. Well, keep it stayed at 1.96. Just to say, hey, we're, we're trying. We're not going to come at you with a 4% increase or a 3.5 or a 2.5. This, and as, as we've said before, as Jeff, you have said a number of times, at some point, this is going to catch up with some of these districts that are going out with 0%. And then they're going to look Otherwise, you know, people have to understand this is, this is what we have to do. Keep Stay where we're it is doing. right now. I, don't, I think we need to just say that we are trying to protect the community. We're not trying to raise it as high as we can. And we're going to try to be creative next to it. Which is sad, but... There's no guarantee that it doesn't cap as it where it is. Because some, some districts will have caps that are very, very low. So we know there's no guarantee where it's going to be. But other, other thoughts from people. I'm inclined to, uh, this is so hard, but I'm inclined to think thinking long term uh, and, and financial planning and solvency that it makes sense to do a small increase now rather than a smaller increase now rather than try to have or, or have to find ourselves in a position where we have no choice but to ask the taxpayers for the maximum. Or make cuts. Or make cuts. Exactly. Or make cuts. Um, that that does not settle at all. Cuts. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, we're already. Uh, I'm inclined to make a small increase now to avoid a large increase. So where we are now is one point nine six. Where I would I would probably suggest that we. Well, I don't, I can't make a suggestion. I would be comfortable. So I will point out the administrative um, line that you're actually referring to. Uh, what I had done in the budget was remove a salary for an individual and put it in the administrative to reflect the duties of that person uh, because that salary was reflected in a line um, where it just didn't make sense. So I was lines? Is that what you're saying? It's the same amount of money, but it was yes. So that's why the special education line didn't really increase as much as it could. Ah, because she's now. Because I took that, that chunk of that salary out. It was so what we're talking about is the instructional administrative uh, report, and that 57% increase is because we took a portion of uh, what was it, the CSE director's salary from the special ed budget and put it in the instructional budget. <laughs> Okay. Other 
there other things? Where did the support did it come from, especially like, that's still on the same budgeting information strategy for general funds? So maybe the special education. So last year at budget, we didn't have as many special education teachers. Either. We had to add a special education teacher after the budget. So the budget does need to increase in the special education lines. Uh, and also, in addition to that, with that salary that was moved from the special education to the administrative portion of the budget, that's why the administrative portion of the budget actually increased. Okay, so are you talking about the decrease of 32,716 in special education? But that's still almost a thirty-one thousand dollar discrepancy. So if that line went down thirty-two thousand, but the line in question went up sixty-three thousand, what happens to the other thirty-one thousand? So there, there's also like there's there's percentages to these uh, to these salaries too. Like they have to increase. Like so, you have you have an additional teacher in one of the one of the salary lines. So I don't I know I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, so I was wondering what made the administrative instruction salaries go up $63,000. And you're explaining that it was a move of an employee from one section of the budget to the other, but the section it came from, it appears that it was only a $32,000 decrease. Because other salaries had to increase in that budget line. That's a yeah. net, that's a net, net decrease. decrease. With all the additional contractual. Okay. All right, there's just no details to explain that. Yeah. Unless I ask it, I'm never going to know. No, I mean, there's so there's uh, in that particular budget line, there's uh, sorry, there's uh, four there's four, four special education teachers that are covered in that section. So, uh, and then, and then you got the last four. Budget, you're saying it was three, is that right? Because we added a special education teacher? And the high school. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, the high school, so yes. There's more special education teachers in the high school. Gotcha. So that it's still not going to get us to where we need to be uh, at a zero um, levy increase there. Are there other things that you're looking at? Uh, yeah, the in-service training instruction went up a little over 17%. What report? Percent. What report? Instructional? Yes. Yes, it's on the instructional. BOCES, which is confusing because I thought ultimately we would get money back from BOCES. The following year in revenue. It's the following year. Okay. Yeah. Are you referring to the 2070 line? I am, yes. Okay, so the 2070 line is actually a contractual expense with uh, the uh, DTA. Uh, that's why that increased. And then the 23-24 uh, budget, because BOCES does have increases also with their trainings. So we have to continue to increase budgets. It's not like the, um, again, we when we um, looking at the BOCES revenues, we received uh, 15,000, right? BOCES, uh, BOCES aid. So 15,000 in, in BOCES aid increase from budget to budget. So it's not, it's not a lot, unfortunately. Just because I'm curious, is that primarily our food aid this year? I couldn't hear, I'm sorry. Is that primarily our food aid this year because we're using them or just? Um, that's just kind of that's a multitude of things. <laughs> sure. And uh, the general fund budget details operations, non instruction salary, that went up 58,000 58, or 32%. Is that still the instructional report that you're looking at? Um, general fund budget details. Am I missing that? Yeah. yeah. I, okay. That's not under my executive um, content. It's in one of those um, reports, Sarah. So is it in instructional, yeah, instructional administrative, special education, instructional operations? She said operation. She said operation. Operation. So. Operational instructional, so oh, the top oh. one on the operations. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So um, we were able to take care of, uh, take advantage of some of the ARPA or the CRSA Act 
Um, we were able to fund that um, so last year. Moving into next year, we have to pay. We have to fully fund our our uh, operations staff. So we're getting it's an increase in that uh, contract. Is that what that is for? It's uh yeah, it's an increase in our yeah. uh, contractual and our salaries. So we pay drivers, aides, cafeteria workers. We sell that contract, and so yeah, this is showing um, that. So we were able to offset that for a time using ARPA money, but eventually it has to get come back into the budget. So it sounds like there's a common theme of the, the contracts forcing us to yes. raise our budget. Yes, Do we have other options? To not, to not the use the contracts that are giving us these substantial increases. No. So, yeah. Yeah. so there are options, they're just hard options to talk about. Yeah. What option? Well, if we didn't use these contracts that made us have these increases that are in driving up our budget. No, we're legally obligated to use the contracts that we have with our our units. Once the contract's signed, basically, it's a. But I mean, like going forward, like once they are not to date anymore, once they've expired, we would yeah, have just, to renegotiate with them. And I would. So, I mean, you can always try with a unit to get them to agree to a lower salary, but I'll tell you right now that next year the DTA salary is up, and we can. You can look at the comparison between uh, teaching staff um, here and elsewhere. So um, that is, you know, you, you always look for people to give stuff back during contract negotiations, but we don't live in a time right now where we have the workforce to draw from to be able to do that. So, so really, those parts are part of the unions. Right, they're all backed by unions. Right. right. So, I mean, what you appropriately so, but they're backed by unions, and that's what's coming to the negotiating table. Correct. Right. And so, this is where we were like several meetings ago when you'd asked about like why are we always talking about cutting teachers? Because at the end of the day, or cutting programs. At the end of the day, that's really the only thing that we can do to um, spend less money is because we have all these contractual expenses that we know go up about three and a half to four percent per year, we know we're going to have to spend that. The only, the only way to fix that is to have fewer of those people. So that's the thing that we can do that would be difficult. There's so many mandates. The only thing to cut is the extra stuff. And there's not a lot of extra stuff. Right, there's not <laughs> a lot of extra stuff. Extra when I say extra right, stuff, exactly. I mean athletics. Yeah. I mean drama. Yeah. I mean all the ACA stuff. I yeah. mean the interesting programs. <laughs> The distance learning, AP, the college stuff, that's what gets cut. The kids that can go to Botech, that being an open program, that's what gets cut. Other people, Shane and Davis? Yeah. I, I'm, okay. Davis, did you want to go? Or? You can have that question. I'm okay with a modest increase, uh, say, to 2.5%. You know, I'm personally, I'm convinced there's not really any fat in our budget. Um, I get that, you know, I mean, obviously as a principal, no one wants to pay more in taxes, but kind of like I said before, you know, the, the, the same economic forces that are squeezing people are squeezing us. Mm -hmm. And so since, uh, you know, so much of our budget is costs that we, you know, don't control like at this moment. You know, basically the contracts or the cost of fuel oh, stuff like that um you know it's reasonable in my mind to set up the school so we're not in jeopardy in subsequent years so uh you know sure we could go out with you know um the 1.96 or zero or something else and that's going to look great but down the road you know we're gonna put ourselves in trouble and I think historically, um, it's pretty clear that the district has done a great job financially for many years. And uh, we've gotten great guidance from, from you guys. And uh, you know, I think we don't want to like, you know, jeopardize that and jeopardize the future of the school. So I'm okay with that. I think it's also important to just you know remind everyone that if we were to go 
that, that the 1.96 is sort of keeping everything as it is, right? So if we were to go below that, which I'm not suggesting, but if we were to go below that, then we are talking about cuts. It's $160,000. $160,000. So that's $80, two to plus. three teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like stuck in the middle right now because I do see everything going up, especially in the workforce. Even where I work, everything is going up. Um, and it is hard to retain people in general. Um, what comes to my mind is living with the means. I remember the same thing being said last year about the increase of the 1.80% tax levy. Um, my thing is is that we're not dipping into that excess money yet, right? I mean, I, I think I just need to see. Not all of it, bit, some of it. But how much of it? So like, you're, gonna see it, a, you're gonna see it more and more. So you gotta stay ahead of it now or else there's not gonna be and later. We don't know what next year is going to bring. We've already got that, that warning that this is the last year of that 3%, that foundation aid, which the foundation aid 3%, $155,000 isn't, isn't enough to, that's, that's, it's not enough, right? So it's uh, a staff member and a half after you pay benefits. So the reality is to see that number again, we don't know what we're going to see next year. Um, so, I mean, to your, yeah, to your point, we haven't spent all of our fund downs in years prior, but the economy has changed, and now we know that we are going to spend more of it. And I mentioned the little exercise that I did, the uh, you know, the March 14th exercise, and I realized like we've spent more money. So, at the end of the year, if you look at our audit to last year, we spent more money last year. Than we did the year before so we did dip into that fund balance what you don't want to do is dip into all of it you don't want to come out at the very end you want to have come out at the end of the year with some savings because it could go the other way and then you got no school is there any yeah, other no other way to cut in certain areas and i'm not talking teachers i'm not talking after school programs or anything like that like reduce the usage of certain things I mean, I'd love it if we could just shut the lights off at 3.30 and then that made up the difference. Yeah. But it really, I mean, there, all those little things that you can shave away, um, those are things that we've kind of done. Um, so we're sort of left with the things that matter. Um, and, uh, you know, also things that are budgeted for that could really hurt us. Like, if we don't budget correctly for special ed, you know, we could have a high cost um, student that moves into the district and then we're really sorry. Right. Um, or we need a student who needs um, a residential placement that costs $80,000 a year or something like that, that we didn't foresee and then we'd be in real trouble. So unfortunately, um, I don't I don't see those things. Um, I wish they were there, but I don't think they are. So the thing that sticks in my head Last year, about May or June, we approved sixty-five thousand dollars from some fund to fill the fuel tanks. Um, and that's going to be eighty thousand dollars this year. I'm you know, just roughly guessing my fuel costs. We don't control that. We just don't. Uh, we don't control any of that. And there's short of doing, like I said previously, cutting the non-mandated stuff. We've got to keep moving forward. So I. I think the 2.5% is probably, I'm not excited about it, I'm not saying ooh, but, you know, I think the costs keep going up, and the costs we don't control, and they're just, we got to ride along at some level. Um, you know, and I think we need to make sure that those in the district that know that, that that might be on the line, that might have problems with that, make sure they know there's programs available, so our star reactions, and make sure they're taking advantage of anything they can. But um, yeah, no, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta move forward. We gotta do. You know, unfortunately, the days of itty bitty tax increases are over. Fortunately, even two more thank you. But 
it's cautious, and I think it's the only thing that's going to keep us moving forward. So that's that's four people. Huh. Would you like us to go forward with that? Do you feel comfortable? And it seems like um, it's with maybe uh, I understand that it's two point five or whatever gets us to only using $100,000 in fund balance. Is that yeah. kind yes. of the logic yeah. behind yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Recenters that number on the same thing we did last year, as far as relying on I think 2.5 is going to be rejected by the taxpayers. And it's way too high. What are you comfortable I mean, I would agree with Sarah. Sarah is yeah, ideal, honestly. Um, I think we all would love that. We love yeah. that. <laughs> but that's, this, is, this is not I a love that. green I'm issue. really excited to see the draw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all love um, to see 0%. Let me just look at this five ten. Well, Ava is, is doing that. I just the, like the fund balance to me is you know the other word for the rainy day fund, and I don't want to plan to use it. Like that's for the emergency stuff when we get you know an, an additional student that we need to provide for. Um, we should never plan to or use tornado. that that <laughs> fund balance. That's there for the emergencies because emergencies always come up. It was just a Subaru today. It was not a good purchase. It's <laughs> not a good way to spend your money. That give you think? No, <laughs> no. I, I, I mean, I feel for I feel for the students who need the extra help. I feel for you know incoming students who are playing from district. I understand all of that. Um, it's just I I guess I think about the single parent taking care of a kid, trying to make ends meet, trying to own their own home, you know, and then having to pay additional taxes each month, even if it's five dollars a month. Yeah, you know, that could mean five dollars towards the kids' lunch for sure. You know, um, that's my main concern. And it's a very real, valid concern. But and the other concern is, is everything is going up in your state. We're one of the highest tax-paying states. People are moving mm -hmm. out of New York State, going to somewhere where it's you know, more cost effective for them. If homes go in foreclosure in our area, where do we get the tax money from? I think to that point, that's where the rainy day fund saves you, right? That's why we have the emergency fund. So if there were some sort of mass exodus, <laughs> that we wouldn't be in default. Yeah. Right. If you if you have no one to collect the tax money from, where are you going to get it from? That isn't. I mean, right. I would just say that that's not a thing that happens overnight. Right. I mean, yeah. There's no family housing stock available in New York. You can't really buy anything out here right now. So that could be that could happen, but it's well, not. property taxes are expected to go up this next coming year significantly, not a little amount, significantly. And then you add additional school taxes. Yeah. So like. On the lower half, but not the lowest. Yeah. Shane was just asking um, for people like what are what are we paying? Yeah. Property taxes, and so on the lower half, but not. Yeah, I remember from past lowest. presentations, you know, that we're definitely spending less per pupil than the average school district. So uh, I think we can do. I've already trimmed the fat. Yeah, I think so. You know, and then actually we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but later in the agenda is, you know, whether we're going to approve the contract for another school resource officer. Right. Right. So those are the types of things. I mean, we have a legal contract with teachers to give them, a, you know, a modest increase year to year, and we have to pay the school costs and stuff like we kind of already talked about that we have yeah. no control over. So you know, it comes down to well. Are we going to cancel contracts for school resource officers to protect our children? You know, those are the types of things mm -hmm. that then come into play because um, when you figure out the contracts and those fuel costs, et cetera, et cetera, that means very little that we actually really have discretion 
to cut from a budget besides program. And school resource officers would be one. And I mean, I, I really support that program. I, I wouldn't advocate for cutting those, but that's kind of when you talk about zero or, you know, a very low increase um, near zero, then those things become a reality and you have to talk about, you know, are we going to have school resource officers in the schools at all? So, I mean, those are kind of the tough decisions that we have to face. I mean, I, I think we have our direction now. So, I don't know if there are other questions about the budget that we can answer um, before going into the next, the next meeting, we'll actually be looking at the whole budget together um, and then deciding how you want to vote on that. Um, so, are there other questions that you have? I just have a request. Jeff, can you do that, that slide that says like per household and with redoing it with the 2.5, not on the spot, but before our next meeting? Oh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, can I can, can tell you what um, 2.5 is equal to 213,420. That's what it will raise. That's the dollar amount. For the whole district. For the whole district. To divide over the, the residents. I'm asking for that one slide. The, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. That'd be awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so we'll move on to presentation approval of prior Board of Education meeting minutes. Meet minutes of the March 7, 2023 Board of Education meeting. Um, as submitted. Do I have a motion? A motion. Thank you, Davis. A second? A second. Tony, thank you. Questions or comments on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. All right. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any extensions? I'll stand with Yep. Moving on to standing committee reports. Audit committee, anything to report? Nothing yet. Building and grounds? Nothing yet. Oh, I did just have a playground committee meeting. Oh, cool. So I got to see a bunch of new playground designs. Um, there's four vendors that we are looking at, um, and they're all fun. <laughs> I mean, it's really fun to look at playgrounds. Um, a couple of them do like really kind of match the aesthetic that we have. A couple of them are in different directions. Um, and so there's a good cross section of people on that playground committee. What we plan to do now is uh, when we get the last design in, we'll look at that last design and then we'll have um, the two vendors that everybody likes the best come in and do a presentation um, to that committee. I, I was going to have them do it to the committee, but um, I can invite the board too. And I can also have them do it. Um, I can put it on the calendar so that people can come to it if they want to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, policy you. committee? No. All right, moving on to financial items. Accept financial reports. Recommendations to the Board of Education accept the general warrant $828,397,607.21 dated February 28, 2023. General Warren 830, $183,405.42. Capital Warren HP 11, $3,820.18, dated March 16, 2023. And appropriation status, budget transfer. Oh, and appropriation status, budget transfer. Got my, uh, Revenue status and ECA reports ending February 28, 2023, as provided and recommended by the Treasurer and Assistant Superintendent of Management Services. Do I have a motion? No motion. Thank you, Francis. A second. Teresa, thank you. Questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Next financial item. Approve agreement with North Greenbush Common School District. Recommendation of the Dwaynesburg Board of Education approve the agreement between North Greenbush Common School District and Dwaynesburg Central School District for September 6, 2022, 
through June 23, 2023, as recommended by Assistant Superintendent of Management Services. This agreement shall not be binding on the parties until authorized and signed by each party's re respective representatives. Do I have a motion? I have a motion. Melissa, thank you. Second? Awesome. Tony, thanks. Questions or comments on this side? This is a private school student, um, and these are the services that the North Greenbush School District, also known as Little Red School House, <laughs> provides to the student um, at LaSalle Private School. Mm -hmm. So that student's moving into our district? Is that what's no, happening? Our He's district. already in our, our school district. He's a private school student. Oh, the other way. Okay, I'm sorry. Like They're closest, members. so they provide right. the services. Right. 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 So. Okay. Any other questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any extensions? Last financial item. Approves Schenectady County SRO addendum. Be it resolved that the Board of Education hereby approves the MOU addendum between the Schenectady County Sheriff's Office and the Duanesburg Central School District dated March 1, 2023 effective March 21, 2023 to June 30, 2023, as recommended by the superintendent. This agreement shall not be binding on the parties until authorized and signed by each party's respective representatives. Do have a motion? Thank you, Sarah. A second? Second. Davis, thanks. Questions or comments about the SRO item? I just have a question. Do we know who, we do know who the person will be, correct? Oh, yes. And then does that change? Potentially, uh, you know, year over year, or is it contracted with that specific employee? Um, it's like a, it's an understanding that it's going to be the same, same person. person. Okay. Yeah, they, they want to give the school district the same continuity. Continu continu yeah. And thank you. Also, I'll just add that, that that's prorated for the end of this year. Right. Um, so it's not that full amount for this year. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Will there be a full amount for next year? So the 70%, it's 70% of the total amount. So that total of 70% is $60,578. Okay. So that's the dollar amount. And then I think we're budgeting half of that in our general budget and then half of it, we are using um, some remaining stimulus money. Right? Stimulus money, yes. For so next year's For next yep. year's. So eventually that'll have to go into the general budget if we choose to keep that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Any abstentions? Moving on to other. Approved Committee on Special Education Minutes. Recommendation of the Board of Education accept the recommendation of the CSC meetings and their minutes from February 28, March 12679 and 13, 2023 meetings. Uh, do I have a motion? Oh, I can second. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Melissa <laughs> and Teresa. Um, questions or comments on this? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Resolution authorizing the initiation of expedited hearing. Resolved that the Board of Education authorizes its Director of Special Education and its attorneys take the steps required by part 201 of the commissioner's regulations to initiate an expedited impartial hearing in the matter of student number 27058 related to placement. Do I have a motion? One motion. Francis, thanks. A second? I'll second. Tony, thank you. Um, any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Next item, approve revised policies. Recommendation of the Board of Education approve the following policies as recommended by the superintendent. Um, policy 6021, sexual harassment in the workplace, Policy 6550, leaves of absence. Policy 7512, student physicals. Policy 7522, concussion management. Policy 7670, due process complaints, selection and board appointment of impartial hearing officers. Do I have a motion? I'll motion. Melissa, thank you. Second. 
That's okay. Uh, Tony, is that okay? Yep. Let's get around. All right, questions or comments on the proposed policies? This is the second reading, if I would call correctly. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't have a comment on the policies per se, but I was absent from the last meeting and there was a discussion that I wanted to add some notes that I jotted down when I was watching the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, just regarding pronoun usage, um, I've been in the policy committee for five years now. Um, there is a huge rehaul of all of the policies and to make them um, consistent and, uh, and fair. Um, just regarding the pronoun usage of there, there is an umbrella term that includes um, that includes all, or it refers to a human. Um, it makes most sense in policies. I would as we are constructing policies for humans in general for people. Um, his or her does not cover all people. Uh, we would like a policy to cover legally. I think we would be at a disadvantage if someone were to argue they were non-binary and that the policy did not apply to them. I wouldn't want to say it into a legal issue because someone didn't feel the policy applied to them or didn't apply to them. Um, our district mission statement is directed at all students, not just male or female students. Our policy should cover all members of the school community. And lastly, um, individual opinions of the binary belief system um, are it's irrelevant. The school district is not a place for individual views on a gender binary system versus a spectrum. Our job is to, to provide for all, and the pronoun there does that. Um, and it just also, it just reads better um, to say um, his and her every time we're reading in a policy. And um, I could go into a grammar lesson on how there are many different languages um, in which um, one certain word can be used for singular and plural as well, dating back to Shakespeare. So um, I just wanted to share those because I was not here to share at the last meeting I was unable to attend. Well, the same thing goes for the word employee or student. So it covers everybody. It's well, absolutely, um, but the, the amount of work that has been done to make it a general umbrella term, going back and changing all of the pronouns to nouns, um, I would like to advocate for Celeste here to go through and change all of those things. Um, the policy manual is like this, um, so um, it just kind of makes things really, really consistent. And that's just my, um, you know, my work on the policy committee has been to make sure that things are consistent and fair. Um, and that we are, whether whether our individual belief system is one way or the other, um, that we're covering everyone and we're also covering our ourselves in the building, which I would like to do. So, thank you. I mean, I guess changing things to they there is a belief system in and of itself. So exactly. you're kind of taking, but you're taking away from some people that do have a belief system. But we to have to include to everyone. Else's we can't have, if we just have his and her. Um, my second point was his and her does not cover all people, even if some people believe that that may. Um, um, but this is not my belief um, system. It is. It is. It's a pronoun that is encompassing all. Yeah, all people, all humans. So for some, for well, some, are, are you done? Uh, let's have I one am. person that have the floor. To oh, I'm done. We can I, speak twice when we discuss. I'm done. Well, no, I just. <laughs> It's probably more appropriate for people to address the issue than kind of face to face. And, uh, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So, um, just who else would like to comment on this? I just, I just want to say that pronoun pronouns. It, it is a belief system with everything that's going on in the world today. Um, using the word employee or student does include everybody. And it prevents offensiveness also. So you have to come into the middle sometimes when working with a community of people. And pronouns don't agree with everybody. The pronouns are a belief system. And a part of speech. Anyone else? this and it's time to vote. Right. So all in favor of the policies? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Moving on to personnel items. 
accept resignation B. Davis. Recommendation that the Board of Education accept the resignation of Benjamin Davis, cleaner, effective March 8, 2023. Do I have a motion? Oh, sure. Francis, Francis and second. Melissa, second. Sure. Thank you. Um, all of, uh, any questions or comments on this? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? More personnel item approve appointments recommendation of the board of education approve the following appointments as recommended by the superintendent all appointments are employees at will an appointment at this time does not guarantee employment for the entire school term or year uh, we have four people dennis duran mike lewandowski glenn golden and eugene weatherington as listed do I have a motion? A motion. Thank you, Teresa. Second. Uh, Tony? <laughs> okay. Uh, questions or comments? I do have a question. Is it the uncertified, does that still have a like a limit of 40 days? Uh, a limit of 40 days as a per team person? Yeah. Um, At one point, maybe it, uh, just dated myself. I don't know, but well, some teachers, teachers. Yeah. Um, I don't know that that's still there. That's changed. I'll find out. I'll get back to you. Anyone else? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? And that brings us to the close of the meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Yes. <laughs> Francis first and Sarah second. <laughs> okay. uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So that closes the meeting for this evening. I know. 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 I know